everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Getting Maximum Information from Small Samples, How Capillary IC Improves Forensic Analysis. I'm Laura Bush, Editorial Director of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LCGC North America and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific, a world leader in serving science. Thermo Scientific provides analytical technologies, reagents, consumables, services, and software for cutting-edge scientific research to routine industrial applications. This web seminar is part of an educational series to provide solutions to pressing application challenges. Now we have a few important announcements before we begin. First, this webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can type your questions in the Submit Question box located below the presentation window. And we'll answer as many questions as we can during the live Q&A session at the end of the broadcast. You can also enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking the Enlarge Slides button located below the presentation window. And the slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the seminar, please just click the Help button, which is also below the presentation window. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Leon Barron is a lecturer in forensic science from the School of Biomedical Sciences at King's College London. Dr. Barron has a BSc in analytical science and a PhD in analytical chemistry under the supervision of Professor Brett Paul. His PhD research investigated the coupling of ion chromatography to electrospray ionization mass spectrometry for the determination of disinfectant byproduct residues in potable water. Dr. Barron subsequently undertook several further postdoctoral fellowships to develop potable low-pressure ion chromatographic technologies and to investigate the occurrence and fate of pharmaceuticals, personal care products, and drugs of abuse in the environment. In April 2009, Dr. Barron accepted a lectureship in the Department of Forensic Science and Drug Monitoring at King's College London, where he now teaches separation science in the longest-running MSc in Forensic Science program in England. He has established his own research group, which focuses on the development and application of new technologies in environmental and forensic science. In November 2011, he was elected as the Honorary Editor of Science and Justice, the Journal of the Forensic Science Society. He also acts as a regular reviewer for several other high-impact peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Barron, thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you get us started? Hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Leon Barron and I would firstly like to thank LCGC North America and Thermo Fisher Scientific for the invitation to present our research to you today. I will be speaking about the use of microborne capillary anion exchange chromatography for small sample analysis. The work particularly focuses on the characterization of gunshot residues and detecting tracer species in sweat and latent human finger marks. This work was approved by the School of Biomedical and Health Sciences, Dentistry, Medicine and Natural and Mathematical Sciences Research Ethics Committee at King's College London. Just a short note about me. As described earlier, I received my PhD at DCU on ICMS and I've been researching ion exchange, chelation and ion interaction chromatography for over 10 years, including the development of new materials for IC separations as well as novel analytical method development. I'm a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry since 2006 and was recently appointed as the editor of Science and Justice, which is the Journal of the Forensic Science Society based in the UK. I lead the SAFER group at King's College London, which focuses on the strategic advancement of forensic and environmental research topics, and I'm especially interested in the crossover between these two fields. I have four current PhD students, of which Elizabeth Gilchrist's results are being presented today. Other funded work includes the development and application of analytical methods towards understanding the fate and effect of drugs in our environment using advanced separations and high-resolution mass spectrometry and also some computational modeling tools. Our group benefits from strong links with a range of industrial partners and forensic practitioners to identify their needs and develop targeted programs for research. This proof of concept work was done partly with the Metropolitan Police Service in London over the past two years. Other related work with them includes several smaller projects with input from students on our MSc in Forensic Science. Just to briefly outline the main topics covered in my presentation today, I will speak a little about ammunition and gunshot residue, or GSR, the currently employed techniques used for its identification, and the potential role for IC in expanding the portfolio of technologies which are applicable in energetic materials analysis. 
Therefore, our aim was to develop analytical methods here using IC for the characterization of the material, as well as identify it in small samples such as fingerprints. On the left, you can see an example of a typical ammunition cartridge used in rifles and pistols today. There are several materials used to make this cartridge, which after discharge ultimately represent themselves in some way in gunshot residue. This residue is composed mainly of burnt and unburnt components of the primer, propellant, cartridge housing, and in some cases the firearm barrel itself. A primer is located at the bottom of the cartridge and is composed generally of a small amount of high-grade explosive. It is friction sensitive and it ignites when the hammer hits the end cap or primer cup of the cartridge. This in turn ignites the propellant, which forces the projectile from the cartridge towards the intended target. Gunshot residue usually exits through the top of the cartridge along with the projectile and is deposited in the surrounding area of the barrel exit and around any other opening in the firearm itself, such as the load or eject tray in an automatic weapon. This residue can also be transferred to the hands of the firer and generally across the area covered between the thumb and the first finger of the firing hand. Therefore, samples taken from the hand or samples of sweat deposited on surfaces could contain traces of GSR to link this activity to a suspect. This is the hypothesis we wish to test. On the right are three types of ammunition that were used for this study. Two of these are rifle casings, the other a pistol casing from a typical 9mm cartridge. For the characterization of GSR in this study, the inner walls of the casings themselves were used as a sort of witness plate to collect discharged material and which were considered as a useful means to preserve the material until extraction and ultimately analysis. Most forensic laboratories search for spherical GSR-specific microparticles, which are largely metallic in nature and are composed mainly of barium, lead and or antimony. Scanning electron microscopy with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, or SEM, EDX, is by far the gold standard for GSR analysis, although it has been shown to suffer from varying degrees of interference, as do many other technologies. For example, misclassifications of GSR are possible due to its similarity to particles found on vehicle brake linings, which can be formed by high temperature frictional forces. Similarly, some research showing the similarity of some firework residues to GSR has been shown by Grima and co-workers in Science and Justice. Lead-free ammunition is also becoming uh, more popular, making it uh, more difficult to analyse reliably. As approximately 13,000 firearm-related incidents were recorded in England and Wales in 2009 and 2010, there may exist a need to focus on other components of GSR, such as low molecular weight organic or inorganic anions or cations to help support forensic evidence where such analytical problems exist. Whilst researching the literature, it seemed odd that there were very few instances of the characterization of GSR for its inorganic ion content. As a recent review by Dalby and co-workers suggest, several such ingredients exist in modern ammunition which could be examined and speciated post-discharge in order to offer some insight into its forensic relevance. Here are some examples. Only a handful of relatively old papers detail such composition with respect to IC and deal predominantly with nitrate and nitrate as tracer species. I will show later on how these species should be considered with caution and especially within a forensic context. Interestingly, this relatively large range of species falls within the remit of IC and therefore a niche may exist here for its use. Similarly, these species are often used as low explosives in improvised explosive devices or IEDs. Therefore, there are benefits in being able to separate all of these species in order to serve multiple purposes. For this work, we focused on the anionic content of GSR only and used the DX500 IC for this purpose. We are currently performing similar studies in our laboratory for cation determinations in GSR, but do not fall within the scope of this presentation. We evaluated three columns, of which the AS20 offered the best selectivity for all species studied. The ASRS Ultra suppressor at 50 milliamps was the most suitable suppressor with an aqueous hydroxide eluent and separations were performed at 0.35 mils a minute in the final method. Overall, it was possible to separate 17 anions studied in under 23 minutes. For reasons I will go into a little later, the extraction was performed by filling cartridge cases with a known volume of ultra-pure water and extracting residues for 30 minutes before filtration and then direct injection of 40 microliter aliquots onto the IC to achieve acceptable sensitivity. 
This slide shows the ion chromatograms obtained from the residues deposited inside all three ammunition cartridge cases. As you can see on the left, up to 15 species were present in some cases. Most of these we could identify at the low to sub mg per litre level, but an early eluting species, which eluted before fluoride, was also present at approximately three minutes. Very few ions elute in this region given that IC separates on size and charge, and fluoride is a small, singly charged species. We inject several possible species such as threonate and quinate without success. Finally, we collected this peak from multiple injections and infused it into an electrospray ionization mass spectrometer and isolated each peak in turn. A product ion scan of MTZ-105 revealed that this species could be glycerate, but unfortunately a standard was not available at this time uh, in order to confirm this. We're still investigating this ion, as it may be very useful for GSR analysis by AC, given its rarity of occurrence, in my experience. Comparing the residues from all three cartridge types, it was also possible to note that the 9mm casing residue contained much larger levels of nitrate and nitrite in comparison to the rifle residues, which contained relatively larger levels of other ions, such as cyanate, CNO-, and thiocyanate, SCN-. From here, we decided to investigate both the individual anion levels present as well as their relative weights to see if any trends were apparent. The use of a simple extraction method using ultra-pure water was employed as it was found that various swabs contained species that could interfere with the analysis. In particular, standard forensic cotton swabs were entirely unsuitable given the number of component ions seen in the figure on the top right. Similarly, the use of extraction solvents posed some problems for interference, as can be seen in the diagram on the bottom left. Filling the cartridge directly with ultra-pure water minimized this, albeit at the cost of added extraction time. The use of organic solvents or alkaline aqueous solutions resulted in peak distortion and or self elution effects in ion chromatography. The time required for 80% extraction of all analytes was approximately 30 minutes. A plateau of cumulative weight extracted was not reached even after one hour in some cases. Therefore, from sampling to results, the analysis time was of the order of one and a half hours. Currently, we are exploring ways to reduce this time using monolithic IC materials, as well as developing methods for simultaneous anion and cation analysis. At this stage, we are unsure whether quantitative analysis in this respect will have a credible forensic usage, but in the interest of characterizing material, we did it anyway. In particular, we wanted to see if the cartridge casings could be differentiated using their GSR component ion ratios. As can be seen on the far left, the ratio of nitrite to nitrate affords little discriminatory value between casings. However, the ratio remains fairly constant at 1 to 1, which could be used very loosely to identify it as an energetic material, possibly, but only where the residue is likely to have been preserved. This ratio could be altered from environmental interferences, as I will show later. Coupled with interferences from extraction, use of nitrite and nitrate ratios as GSR markers in trace analyses should be used with extreme caution, in my opinion. However, when examining other ions, such as cyanate and thiocyanate, some differences between the residues could be determined. This may be of some use in forensic analyses where a single 9mm round is recovered, but the brand may not be identified by other methods is a physical identification. The residue on this casing as well as the firearm could also be potentially used to link both using this ratio. These ions were present in the mg per litre range which is unusually high for environmental interference to be significant. Both are rarely seen together at such an appreciable level in other sources in our experience, environmentally or otherwise, whereas nitrite and nitrate commonly occur together in environmental samples in particular. Here are some examples of typical sources which could interfere with single ion identification or interrupt ion ratio determinations by IC, especially at the trace level. As mentioned earlier, brake pad residues from vehicles can be misclassified as GSR. However, while some GSR-relevant ions were present, such as nitrite and nitrate again, here IC could be used to show that these were not similar in their ion content or ion ratios, especially when considering cyanate, thiocyanate, and the potential unknown glycerate peak. To further iterate the point, nitrate was observed at appreciably high levels in the laboratory mains water supply. Chloride, sulfate, carbonate, thiosulfate, as well as some low levels of organic acids were also present, but none inter interfered with GSR-related species. 
Following the characterization of GSR, we were very interested in the possibility for detection of energetic materials in single latent human fingerprints left at a crime scene. Similarly, if detected, we also wanted to understand whether these materials would persist in successive fingerprint depositions. For this, we investigated capillary IC as a means to achieve the required mass sensitivity by reducing system dimensions. The weight of a fingerprint varies greatly with temperature and print size, for example, but it is approximately of the order of about 50 micrograms. We used an ICS 5000 system from Thermo Fisher Scientific for this work. New resin materials have recently become available with the introduction of this system, and we were particularly interested in a comparison of monolithic and particle pack columns on the capillary scale. For those of you who are not familiar with monoliths, these materials represent a single piece of solid porous stationary phase which is placed inside a column housing. This format is therefore very different to traditional columns which have several tightly packed particles inside. Their porous nature results in lower back pressures, allowing higher flow rates to be used, which may in turn reduce analysis times. We investigated the MAX100, which is a very similar phase in its selectivity to an iron pack AS11HC, and we were interested in whether we could increase the speed of our analysis. We also investigated the same phase used in the microbore separations we showed earlier, the AS20, but this time on capillary scale. These phases are particularly suitable for the determination of perchlorate, which is often used in explosives. In the end, we decided to go with the packed phase, given the extra separation selectivity it offered. The other conditions listed here represent the ones optimized using the AS20 phase. However, as you'll see shortly, the MAX100 was sufficient for the separation of multi-component mixtures and offered some time saving for analysis. Most importantly, you can see that the injection volume was only 0.4 microliters, roughly 100 times less than that required for our microbore method. Injection of such a small amount was achieved by means of a four-port fixed internal loop valve. I'll touch a little later on the sensitivity we achieved with this method, but first we wanted to explore the performance of both phases for energetic material separations. We wish to investigate any evidence of high mass transfer and efficiency, as well as the possibility to run samples faster using monolithic ion exchange columns. Using similar flow rates, on the left you can see that a 27% reduction in back pressure could be achieved in comparison to particle pack capillaries. The diameters of these columns were different and had different internal void volumes due to their physical nature. Overall, we could pump a maximum flow rate of 18 microliters per minute before safe system pressure was breached using the monolithic column. The possibility for faster flow rates could naturally be achieved by removing a system back pressure coil, which is normally required at lower flows to make electrolytic devices perform optimally. When examining matched linear velocities, which was a more appropriate way to compare pressure drops on columns of different dimensions, a 55% reduction in pressure was observed with the monolith. Therefore, those of you who are requiring faster analysis time by increasing flow rate could potentially investigate this capillary scale option without having to use large volumes of eluent, normally required at analytical scales. By examination of the Van Deemter curve on the right-hand side, the monolith did not show similar efficiency to the particle-packed AS20 capillary, but still was suitable for small ion separations, as I'll show a little later. In particular, the C term showed a much steeper slope, meaning that efficiency was compromised somewhat at higher flow rates. For this reason, we retained the AS20 for this analysis and the monolith was not considered further. An interesting study using both phases with the effect of temperature on selectivity for small ions. And for the next few slides, I would like to discuss this rather understudied variable in method development as I think you'd find it quite useful. As can be seen in these Van Hoff plots, which are a plot of retention factor versus inverse temperature, selectivity on both resins varied considerably and often unpredictably with temperature across both phases. With an increase in temperature, some anions displayed increases in retention, whereas some decreased and did not necessarily behave similarly on either phase. Those of you who are working on method development could potentially use this approach to more fully optimize your separation of closely eluting species after eluent chemistry has been explored fully. As can be seen here even further, an increase in efficiency was observed on both resins for an increase in temperature for a selection of species despite their thermodynamic retention behavior being opposite in some cases. For example, on the monolithic resin, for chlorate, retention decreases with increasing temperature, which is opposite to the effect observed on the AS20. However, as can be observed here, for chlorate peak efficiency improved at higher temperatures on both columns. 
Therefore, as one of the most understudied variables in iron chromatography and indeed chromatography in general, temperature could potentially be used to control both the separation efficiency and the selectivity. Under gradient conditions, it can be observed that the separation of a large selection of geosaur and environmentally relevant species could be optimized with temperature. The AS20 afforded the best separation overall at 25 degrees and a slightly elevated flow rate of 11 microliters per minute due to a reduced viscosity of the mobile phase. Here are examples of the separations achieved on the monolith at incremental temperatures from 30 to 45 degrees. As you can see, different retention behavior resulted in selectivity changes. This slide shows the instrument performance of the capillary IC system and a comparison of detection limits to that of the microbore method shown earlier. As can be observed, approximately a thousand-fold improvements in mass sensitivity could be achieved using this approach. Expression of mass limits of sensitivity was more appropriate in this case since we wish to quantify levels of a residue left behind on the surface. In my opinion, this is the greatest benefit of capillary IC. For us, another real benefit is that more replicates can be made of such small samples in order for us to boost confidence in our results. The linearity and range were also examined and showed that the method performed well over three orders of magnitude, from 25 micrograms per litre to 50 mg per litre. R squared values represent bilogarithmic correlations in this case of signal versus concentration to spread the data more evenly over this range. We did investigate the use of a 4 microliter loop uh, on this capillary scale to boost sensitivity even further, but we found the system struggled with varied concentrations of analytes present in the sample. Larger loops could possibly be used, though maybe for samples containing lower concentrations of ions or where complete characterization is not required. There are several papers which detail capillary electrophoresis as an orthogonal separation technique for ion analysis. I've just selected some which deal specifically with energetic materials, and it can be seen that this method complements CE for the analysis of limited size samples in this case. In fact, within a forensic setting, we would prefer to use both techniques rather than one in isolation for orthogonal confirmation of the ions present. The figure on the left shows the comparison of the optimized methods on the microbore and capillary IC systems overlaid. As our system configuration and the conditions were not identical, it was expected that some differences would occur, but on the whole, separation using the same resin on both scales were very similar, and shows that the method could be transferred readily to capillary scales. On the right, it can also be seen that noise was much reduced on the more modern ICS 5000 pumping systems than our rather dated DX500. The use of capillary scale instrumentation offers the possibility for much reduced eluent consumption. The manufacturers have stated that this makes the system always on and always ready. In our laboratory, we examined a moderately long study on reproducibility and found that retention over approximately 70 replicates for a 1 mg per litre sulfate peak was less than 0.1%, which was impressive. This roughly equates to a two-day period. A trend towards a decrease in retention was observed especially for this sulfate peak, as you can see on the right. And this was concluded to be related to a very mild instability of the AS20 resin surface structure, rather than a reduced instrument performance. Manufacturers have recommended one-month intervals for change of the eluent reservoir. However, this system was left on for over 90 days without interruption and consumed less than 2 litres of ultra-pure water as an eluent. Towards the end of this period, indeed, some system peaks were apparent, and potentially due to microbial growth in the eluent. But once this eluent was replaced, these were eliminated. This slide shows a series of sweat extracts which were taken from the hands of smokers and non-smokers. Previous research has shown that thiocyanate can be used as a marker for smoking behavior, and it was observed here in the sweat of smokers along with benzoate. If at appreciably high levels, then this could interrupt an ion ratio. However, as can be observed, and despite the complexity of the sample, Thiocyanate was present at very low levels in comparison to that found in GSR. Here I've shown an example of several extracts of single latent human fingerprints taken before and after discharge of a firearm. In collaboration with the Metropolitan Police Service, we collected fingerprints from donors after three successive shots of a 9mm Glock pistol, which are deposited on glass microscope slides. As can be seen on the right, some ions are more expressed after firing than others. In particular, B shows elevated levels of nitrite and nitrate, which I mentioned before may be traditionally linked to explosives and GSR. 
T and D show very minor increases in the unknown early eluting species as well as cyanate. It is thought that donors sweating during the firing experiment is the more likely reason to be the source of increased nitrite and nitrate levels rather than from GSR, as we would expect similar increases in the early eluting species and cyanate also. The ratio of all species should also match that of the GSR extract to some extent. It seems from this preliminary study that less than 0.1% of the residue on the inner wall of the cartridge could be detected in deposited fingerprints. Rather than this being a fault of the method giving its femtogram to picogram sensitivity, it is likely that these simply do not transfer appreciably to the thumb of the firer during discharge. However, we did detect it even at this low level, even if it was quite small. This is an important forensic finding, and we hope to continue this study to prints from other fingers, as well as studying a fire's hand in more detail to locate the largest masses of these tracer species deposited. Black powder substitutes are commonly used both as propellants in muzzle-loading rifles and as low explosives. We could determine direct contact with such materials very easily in deposited fingerprints, and levels of perchlorate, benzoate, and nitrate could all be observed clearly, as you can see. The material was handled for less than 10 seconds, any excess wiped away until it was no longer visible to the naked eye, and then fingerprints were deposited on glass slides. Furthermore, we examined the persistence of these materials as a depletion series. Depletion series are used regularly to test sensitivity of traditional fingerprint chemical development techniques by successively placing fingerprints on a test surface. The assumption is that less material or sweat is deposited as a mark in successive prints and can be evaluated using several donors with different sweat expression behavior. In all five deposited fingerprints in our study, perchlorate, benzoate, and nitrate could be detected at comparable ratios to that in the original black powder substitute. Also, after depositing contaminated fingerprints, donors were asked to wash their hands in ultra-pure water and donate one single print to determine if the material remained on the hands. No trace was observed in prints after washing. Therefore, it is likely that persistence is low and that fingerprints recovered at the scene may be used to establish a relevant time interval. Ultimately, the potential for linking criminal identity to activity through the analysis of fingerprints could therefore be established using this technique under these circumstances. Conclusions. We were able to detect a range of GSR-related species and in some way differentiate the ammunition type used. Most importantly, the transfer to capillary IC was smooth and offered superior mass sensitivity as I showed earlier. This, in my opinion, is the greatest advantage of these systems, coupled with a very low element usage. More work is required to understand the deposition of these GSR species on the hands after firing, but as a first attempt, it was possible to detect it. However, direct contact with low explosives was possible by analysis of latent human fingerprints. Apart from those experiments discussed previously, we do hope to carry on by developing ICMS-based methods, as well as finish off some similar work examining cation content in GSR. For those of you who are interested, this work was accepted in January to analysts and is available online as an advanced article. I have listed other relevant published work here using an array of IC technologies and modes that may be of interest to you. So finally, some acknowledgements. I would firstly like to thank Dr. Norman Smith, who is the second supervisor of my PhD student, Elizabeth Gilchrist, on the far right of the picture. This represents her hard work over the last 12 months or so. I would also like to thank the Metropolitan Police for assisting with the firearm study and Thermo Fisher Scientific for the loan of the capillary IC system. Finally, I would like to thank you for listening and if you have any queries, I'd be happy to try to answer them either via email or after this presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. That was a very informative presentation. Before we get started with the question and answer session, I would just like to remind the audience how to submit questions. You can type your questions in the small text box that is located in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and then you just have to click the Submit button, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Okay, so let me uh, refresh my list here, and let's start in with the questions. So, Dr. Barron, here's one, the first question. What weights of anions detected were present in fingerprints? Okay, um, the weights detected in the fingerprints um, varies between individuals, really, um, but approximately we saw orders of 30 nanograms to about 2.7 micrograms. 
that was kind of the range that we saw in the fingerprints we studied. That may be even more um, wide or expanse. It just was on the small sample set that we had. Very good. Thank you. Um, and what concentration sensitivities could you achieve with the two systems? Ah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people considering the capillary system will, will think that it will give you enhanced concentration sensi uh, sensitivity. The, the microbore method that we developed, um, the range of sensitivities, concentration sensitivities we got were between 3 and 88 micrograms per litre for all species. And the capillary system was relatively similar, albeit a little bit lower on the front end, with 0 0.7 to 64 micrograms per litre. So concentration sensitivity is, is quite similar. Um, the, the advantage really is the mass sensitivity because it's the, the GSR and explosive residue is left on a surface. And also that we, we consumed very, very small amounts of eluent over the time period of study. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, another question from a user. What concentration sensitivities could you achieve with the two systems? No, that's oh, the same That's the I'm same sorry, question. I just read you the same question. That's all right. So next question. Did you rinse the swabs before analyzing their ion content? Did we rinse them? Um, we analyzed dry swabs and swabs with rinsed, uh, rinsed with deionized water. There was not a really big significant change in ion concentrations. It got a little bit cleaner. Um, the cotton swabs are commonly used to collect samples for IC uh, and as well in forensic casework. So I think um, this study shows that maybe other collection methods should be considered, especially using IC in order to prevent ca contamination. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, let's see. And why did you analyze drinking water? Well, I think my background is, is in environmental science. Um, I did my PhD on drinking water. Um, so we, we did quite a lot of work at that time period on trace species in, in drinking water. Um, and one of the things I noticed, certainly from reading the papers, is that a lot of uh, studies, or some of the older studies, use nitrite and nitrate as, uh, as target species for, for explosives. But these, are regularly, um, these regularly occur in environmental samples and were present in our main supply as well. So we ran the drinking water um, sample just to give us a, a, an environmental sample to compare next to. Obviously, that represents a fairly clean sample, uh, an environmental sample. So other samples, maybe such as rainwater or river water, for instance, would be a lot more um, heavily uh, contaminated with ions. So uh, it's a relatively clean example of an environmental sample that we could use to test the, the method. Okay, very good. And in your study, how long was it before the fingerprints were analyzed? Um, the fingerprints were taken and extracted immediately. Uh, one of the things with the fingerprints is that as soon as the fingerprint is deposited, it starts to lose water mass. Um, so we wanted to prevent evaporation. Um, so we, we looked at a 10-minute extraction of the fingerprint on an analytical balance in 500 microliters of, of water deposited with a pipette. Um, we did see some loss of, of total water volume, about 8%. That was corrected for and uh, then included in the calculation of the concentrations we observed. So yes, uh, pretty, pretty much imme immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. And what type of sample preparation is required for cotton swabs with IC? Yeah, sample preparation for cotton swabs, um, realistically speaking, we, because we're taking a sample from a surface, uh, we just wipe the surface with the um, with, with the swab. Sometimes it's pre-wet. Um, sometimes we use a, a series of, of of dry followed by wet or wet followed by dry. It depends. Um, and then it's extracted in um, in ultra pure water to minimise any contamination from the extraction solvent uh, for about 10-15 minutes um, in order to get some appreciable sensitivity. We're more interested in the ion ratios rather than the absolute measurement. Mm -hmm. And do you think you could apply your fingerprint technique to dusted, lifted fingerprints? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a good question, but first we have to eliminate the, um, the dusted material or whatever chemical treatment was used. I think that's, that's certainly one of the hot topics that we're, we're looking to do. But I would say that um, certainly what we want to see is because we're just, put, putting, um, we're just putting some dr droplet of water onto a fingerprint directly, um, we'd like to see the persistence of that print before it's actually extracted. Obviously, it's hard to see the latent print uh, on a surface, but if it's non-destructive of the print, um, then, then you could possibly develop it afterwards. Um, I don't know, um, but certainly that's something we want to do. Very good. 
Well, Dr. Barron, I think we need to wrap up. Thank you so much for your excellent talk and for answering those questions. And um, if we have any unanswered questions, we can um, answer them offline after the talk. You're very welcome. Okay. So unfortunately, we'll we need to wrap up. And I'd like to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please note that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of next year. You'll receive an email from LCGC North America alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We look forward to seeing you all next time. Goodbye. <laughs>